Welcome everyone, thanks for joining. We're gonna be talking today again about Bill Ackman. I know, we've been talking a lot about Bill Ackman and I recently did a video on how to pick stocks like Bill Ackman. What I did in that video was I, I reverse engineered his stock picking method by looking at commonalities and common traits in all the companies that he invests in. All the ones that he buys and sells have many things in common, and that was mostly focused on the fundamentals. So the things like the EBITDA, the free cash flow, the share buybacks, the dividends, the earnings per share growth, so on and so forth. I looked at commonalities. So if you wanna see kind of a precursor to this video, you can go back and watch that one. I'll link it in the description. But this video is a follow-up on that one because a lot of people had a common criticism. They said, Joseph, it's good that you're looking at all the commonalities in the fundamentals like the EBITDA and free cash flow, but you know that Bill Ackman is doing much more research than that. He's not just looking at some fundamentals and buying the companies. He understands the business. He has a whole research team. So we want to see inside of his head, what is he thinking about when he's buying these companies? What is he really considering qualitatively with these companies? So that's what we're going to be diving into in this episode. We're going to be expanding across that first video from the fundamentals and going more into the qualitative side into what these companies actually are. Luckily for us, Bill Ackman just recently released the Pershing Square Holdings 2021 Annual Report. And in this, he gives very in-depth breakdowns and descriptions of specifically what he values in the companies that he's holding. So he's sharing a lot of valuable insight here. I read through some of it and I was pretty blown away by the insights that he shares openly. So I wanna go through this, dissect a little bit and see what we can learn together. Because you might be asking, why am I paying so much attention to Bill Ackman? Well, frankly, you know, opinions vary. You may not like the guy. You may not like his personality or his CNBC appearances or his vocal op opinions on different subjects like Ukraine or whatever. I get that some people don't like his personality, but the performance speaks for itself. Bill Ackman is an incredibly good investor. He's one of the best investors alive. The numbers show that. If you look at his performance of his fund, this is net of fees, meaning factoring in the 20% performance fees that he charges, plus the 16% outperformance fees. He charges massive fees in this fund and net of the fees, he's still destroying the S&P 500. Look at this performance overall. These two lines are his performance. That's his fund. And then you look at the S&P 500 below, 484% returns versus 1,670% net of fees. That is outperformance. To look at it another way, he's returned 17.1% annualized since inception. Again, that's net of fees compared to the S&P 500's 10% annualized, and that's not counting in any type of expense ratio. So he has blown away the S&P 500. The results speak for themselves. And I do think that he shares valuable advice in this letter. So we have a lot to jump into. Let's go ahead and get to it. So let's go ahead and start off first of all with kind of the framework of how Bill Ackman views all the macro events going on. So how he views this through the lens of an investor. We have the war with Ukraine. He says the war in Ukraine is a tragedy. Watching innocent people die due to the political and geographical objectives of one man is something one would hope would have never occurred. I think most people can agree with that. Ukraine is putting up a fierce fight and much of the Western world is helping with aggressive sanctions, military equipment and funding, but we need to do more. Russia's horrific actions must be made to be extraordinarily expensive and punishing for its military and its economies so that we deter and hopefully eliminate such aggression, destruction and loss of life in the future. So that's a little bit of his political view on the circumstances in Ukraine with Russia. He is uh, he's very much involved in that. If you follow his Twitter, he's constantly tweeting stuff in support of Ukraine. So that's a little bit of politics. That's where he stands on the issue. He says the economic implications of the war are significant in amplifying inflation in energy, agriculture, and other goods and services, and tempering the risk appetites of investors and corporations. The prospects of high inflation, deteriorating growth, and the potential for the US and global recession have increased significantly. Russia has become uninvestable. I think that's obvious now. China is not far behind due to their crackdown on corporations and high profile CEOs. It's the reason that Alibaba took a huge nosedive. And their tactic approval of Russia's actions. So China is more on the side of Russia than the US. US companies were already in the process of reshoring and nearshoring their supply chains, which will accelerate due to the increasing geo geopolitical uncertainty 
Deglobalization is inherently inflationary. Risk premiums should also continue to rise. So he's setting a bit of the backdrop. We have war, inflation, rising tensions with the biggest economic power in the, wor the world besides the U.S., which is China, right? The biggest growing power. Uh, and then obviously Russia is completely uninvestable at this point. Seems like a bad time to be investing. Now he says, why then? You might ask, do we remain fully invested? So Bill Ackman is fully invested right now, despite all those major headwinds and economic factors. And he outlines two reasons why. He says, first, we believe that the businesses we own have substantial pricing power. That's a big thing. They always look for pricing power. That is the ability to adjust prices upward without losing customers to competitors. And they also outline the second thing here. We believe that our hedges will likely generate substantial liquidity that will enable us to take advantage of opportunities in the event of substantial market declines. So this is something that Pershing Square does and Bill Ackman routinely does that so far I've done none of. I haven't mimicked this approach at all. He has hedges with his portfolio. And like a hedge fund, he should probably try to have hedges and protect the downside. That's something that investors are paying him a hefty fee to do. But this is something that I just don't feel great at. I don't feel like I understand hedges and the risk reward and, and kind of how they work. So that's an area that I want to learn about is how to hedge my portfolio and take advantage of market declines. So that is something that I'm actively learning about and studying. Maybe I'll implement hedges in my portfolio in the future, but right now I'm just 100% long. I have no hedges on my portfolio. And he says that we believe that hedging is a better alternative to keeping funds in cash while one is waiting for opportunities, particularly because high interest rates cause inflation, uh, uh, the purchasing power and cash to decline rapidly which is obvious. With inflation at 6 or 7%, maybe it will go higher, maybe lower, your cash is getting eaten up by that. Either way, cash is not a good thing to hold right now. Now he goes on saying, the industries and businesses in which we have invested in are highly attractive and well positioned to withstand negative externalities. Negative externalities is a fancy way of saying Outside forces of macro events and wars and competitors will be withstood by these companies. That is a way that uh, Buffett defines having a moat, a big body of water around the castle that fends off competitors, right? Well, this is another way of saying not only competitors, but also macro events, wars, inflation, and so on. They can withstand negative externalities. About 30% of our equity portfolio is invested in music and video streaming, UMG and Netflix. That's video streaming and music. 26% is in restaurants and restaurant franchising, Chipotle restaurant brands and Domino's, 15% in a home improvement retailer. He went with Lowe's. I currently have Home Depot in my dividend portfolio. 10% in real estate in states with substantial in-migration. That's the Howard Hughes company he highlights here. That is a real estate company that Pershing Square has. And in residential mortgages, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, 10% in hotel franchises, which is Hilton, and 8% in railroad, which is Canadian Pacific. So that's a new holding to the portfolio. We expect that each of these companies will grow their revenues and profitabilities over the long term, regardless of recent events and the various other challenges that the world will face over the short, intermediate, and long term. So Bill Ackman is a long-term investor. He holds companies for three years, five years, sometimes longer. If he still continues to see value, he'll hold companies for five years plus. What I like about Bill Ackman, when I compare him with investors like ARK Invest with Kathy Wood, is although she's had good returns, I see her trading every single day with the emails. I get the email updates. And they're just trading in and out of stocks every two seconds. There's dozens of them being sold and being bought every two seconds. And I compare that with Bill Ackman, and he's not buying and selling companies every single day. He waits until they get to good prices, he buys in, then he holds them long term. Now, this next paragraph I think is interesting. He goes on to highlight why he prefers investing in North America, in the US, over the rest of the world. He explains why. He says, while effectively all businesses are exposed to the global economy, we have chosen to invest close to home. Our portfolio is North American centric with most to all of our company's profits generated in North America. While the US has its shares of problems, including a highly litigious business environment, a complex regulatory regimen, and political disharmony and div divisiveness, we believe these factors are substantially outweighed by a legal regimen where the rule of law is generally respected, more so in most of the other places of the world. 
limited corruption, a world-class military and defense, and a corporate and capital market environment where capitalism can flourish. We believe that these attractive attributes will increase in importance to investors in light of recent events. Much of the same way the world is deglobalizing, deglobalization appears to be coming to the capital markets. So I think that in terms of macro events, Bill Ackman is not anywhere close to investing in Tencent or Alibaba or JD. He doesn't even seem to want to invest outside of the US at all. Because I think with the deglobalization, he sees more opportunity in the US than anywhere else. And he spells it out pretty clearly here. Obviously, with my investment in Alibaba just tanking month after month, primarily due to concerns about the government, I can see his point here. It doesn't really matter how good your companies are or how good their free cash flow is or so on and so forth if investors can't trust the government. They'll never give it the multiple or the market cap or the valuation that it deserves. If it was a US company, they will give it that multiple and that market cap. So in hindsight, I agree with him. I'm not making any new investments in the China. I still have my Alibaba holding and I'm still holding on to it, but I'm limiting my exposure outside of the US for the same aforementioned reasons. And this next paragraph is where he just really lays out the type of things he looks for. And this is, again, many of the type of things that we identified when we did a reverse deconstruction of his portfolio. We reverse engineered it. He said, we expect our portfolio companies to continue to compound their intrinsic values at even higher rates than before due to their current reduced valuations. We believe that all of our portfolio companies will generate long-term durable growth due to their dominant market positions, substantial free cash flow generation, high returns on capital, pricing power, and strong balance sheets. Furthermore, and this is something specifically that I pointed out, most of our companies use their free cash flow to repurchase their own shares so our portfolio companies and their shareholders are the long-term beneficiaries of their recently reduced stock prices. Because again, as the stock price goes down, the share repurchases carry a lot more weight. While most investment managers prefer to report consistent growing returns to their investors, we prefer to have intermediate periods of downward volatility as they create opportunities to plant the seeds for greater long-term outperformance. And I definitely think that that's not just investor speak. I really think that he likes these type of periods. He'll probably be doing a lot of buying into these type of companies with this pullback. So that's kind of him setting the foundation of his thought process overall. Now we're gonna start jumping into individual companies. Let's start off with Netflix. Before I look at what Bill Ackman says with Netflix, in full disclosure, it is one of my largest positions. And I'm currently way down on this company. So. I'm well in the red on it, and that's my fault for buying it at a higher price. I acknowledge that, but I remain very bullish on this company. I've talked extensively about the many attributes that I like of Netflix, that I think it will be a long-term compounder. I think a lot of the challenges they're facing, the issues they're going through, will be very short-lived. So even after this company fell substantially in price because of one bad quarter, their forecast was pretty bad. I continued to buy more of the company. I kind of doubled down on it. I increased my position after the decline. Now, having said that, let's go ahead and look at what Bill Ackman says. He says, we have long admired Netflix and had initially researched and analyzed the company as part of our investment due diligence on UMG. We then updated and completed our work January when the stock price declined due to disappointing subscriber guidance. Much like UMG, we believe that Netflix is well positioned as a leading beneficiary of the long-term secular growth in streaming. A high quality business overseen by a world-class management team, Netflix established subscription video streaming when it launched its service back in 2007. And over the subsequent 15 years, it has achieved global scale with 222 million paid subscribers today in more than 190 countries. So Netflix already has massive global scale. The next thing he says is a highly debated point. A lot of people think that Netflix's growth has kind of tapped out. Their total addressable market has already been addressed. This is where Bill Ackman and I agree, and we differ from a lot of other people here. He says despite its large scale, Netflix is still in the early stages of capitalizing on the decade-long secular growth in streaming video and correspondingly, the decline in linear pay TV. Current subscribers amount to less than a quarter of today's estimated total addressable market of 800 to 900 million households that have either fixed broadband access or subscribe to pay TV, excluding China. So even without China, without Russia, Bill Ackman sees potentially 
800 to 900 million households subscribe to Netflix. And again, right now they're at 222. So they are less than a quarter of the way there. And again, that's how I view this company. I think we're in the early innings of streaming as well. He goes on to actually define the value proposition of Netflix. So recently we've had a lot of people complain that Netflix is raising prices. They complain that Netflix is going to start charging for sharing, sharing passwords in the US to people outside of your household. There's a lot of people that I think have somewhat valid complaints, but consider the value proposition you're actually getting with Netflix. He says that Netflix offers consumers on-demand, commercial-free, bingeable content with ubiquitous access at a price point that is approximately 80% less expensive than average pay TV package in the U.S. So it's 80% less expensive than your cable package. A Netflix subscription is one of the lowest cost forms of high-value entertainment with cost per hour of engagement of about 30 cents. The company's vastly superior value proposition relative to pay TV and other forms of entertainment should drive substantial pricing power and meaningfully increase its penetration across its addressable market over time. So he's basically saying that Netflix still offers incredibly good value, especially compared to cable television. The value proposition is dramatically better, and the total addressable market continues to grow as the internet and connected devices become more ubiquitous. Now, he goes on to explain how well positioned Netflix is in terms of their competition. We hear about all the competition coming, and he explains why Netflix might be better positioned to handle this competition than investors are giving it credit for. He says Netflix is well positioned as a dominant market leader with several advantages relative to existing legacy media incumbents and large capitalization technology entrants. So the big bad cable companies with deep pockets and these large media companies that are now going into streaming, they form a competitive challenge for Netflix. But Bill Ackman doesn't think that that's doom and gloom for Netflix. He thinks that they can handle this challenge. He says the company has a diverse library of content for everyone that is replenished at a much faster rate than competitors. It releases 150 to 200 original content episodes per month, 150 to 200, more than the volume released by Prime Video, Hulu, Disney, and HBO Max combined. Netflix's industry-leading subscriber base has enabled the company to establish a very profitable business while spending more on original content than the competitors. So that is Netflix's flywheel in action. As the pay TV cord cutting accelerates in mature markets, we believe there will be consumer appetite to subscribe to multiple streaming services at a time. In the US, we estimate that the wallet share released from the declining linear pay TV subscriptions, which are priced at approximately $80 per month can easily sustain a streaming bundle of three to five streaming services per household, which are typically priced around 10 to $15 per month, offering a significantly better customer experience. So the way that he thinks about this is pretty simple. Most households have been spending somewhere around $80 per month on their cable TV. So if they get rid of the cable TV and they move over to streaming, if they're doing the cord cutting, they'll think of it as, well, I'm spending $15 a month on Netflix, I can add on Disney Plus for like eight bucks a month. I can add on HBO Max for 15 bucks a month. I can add on Discovery or Warner Media or whatever, Showtime, right? I have all these subscription services and even together, they don't even add up to 80 bucks. I'm still saving money. And the assumption here is, I think a safe assumption, is that among the three to five streaming services the average household will have, Netflix is probably gonna be one of them. It'll probably be one of the streaming services you continue to have. So this is just part of his thoughts on Netflix. So of course, Bill Ackman doesn't just look at PE ratios. He doesn't just look at the free cash flow. He does in-depth analysis on every company that he invests in. And that's something that I've been trying to promote to people for a long time. You're buying a company with a business model and products and employees and leadership. You're not just buying charts and graphs, right? You can look at the charts and graphs, but you have to plug it into the company. And when you put those together, that makes it so you can form a well-rounded story. You actually have an entire investment thesis there. So this is what Bill Ackman is doing. He has all the numbers. He has all the qualitative research. He puts that together to create an investment thesis. Continuing on with Netflix, he goes on to show some of the unique qualities of this company. He goes on to say that Netflix has the lowest churn rate by a wide margin amongst streaming services. That means people don't cancel Netflix all that often. They cancel other streaming services much more frequently. 
highlighting its core position as an anchor, a utility-like service of any streaming bundle. Netflix's retention in the U.S., its most competitive market, has remained consistently stable at an industry high levels despite the launch of several new competitors. And this is what management of Netflix has been trying to highlight. Look, we have tons of competitors now and people aren't canceling Netflix here. That is a very positive thing. They're not signing up quite as fast in the rest of the world, but the churn rate remains very low in the US. Now the international markets are the earlier stage growth markets where Netflix has an even more formidable first mover advantage and a significant competitive position in local language content. Only Netflix has unique and proven track record of elevating regional productions like Squid Game, Casa de Papel, Lupin, to a global cultural zeitgeist. So they're the only ones that have been able to do that. So far, uh, other companies like Disney can really only market what they make in the US to the rest of the world. But Netflix is creating things outside of the US and marketing it all over the place. And that is something that has so far been unique to Netflix. As Netflix's business has achieved scale, its operating profit margins have increased from 4%, 4% in 2016 to 21% in 2021. Over the last five years, Netflix has held content spend per subscriber constant despite growing overall content spend by 23% per annum. So they have spent 23% per year more on content. At the same time, the company has increased prices by 7% annually, resulting in a dramatically improved subscriber unit economic. So a lot of people are upset by these 7% price increases, but they are getting a 23% increase in content spend. So the proposition actually improves. He says, from the customer's perspective, Netflix's value proposition has become better each year as the growth in the volume of new high quality content has comfortably exceeded price increases. We believe that the combination of continued subscriber growth and pricing power will allow the company to leverage its growing content spend over an even larger future subscriber base, which will drive substantial future margin expansion and provide better value proposition to its subscribers each year. That's a continuation of the flywheel that we've talked about. And this is where he finishes up on Netflix. He highlights the price coming down while every fundamental of Netflix is basically improving. He says, the opportunity to acquire Netflix at an attractive valuation emerged as investor concerns over management's short-term guidance exacerbated by recent market volatility. It led to substantial declines in the company's share price. Despite a 47% increase in revenue, approximately 800 basis points in margin expansion, and a vastly improved free cash flow profile over the last two years, as of March 22nd, 2022, Netflix's share price is down approximately 45%. So all these fundamentals improve dramatically, but Netflix's stock price falls 45% from its recent highs and it's trading below its February 2020 pre-pandemic share price. That's pretty incredible, and I think that's, of course, why he jumped in. Although we expect some near-term variability in the company's quarterly growth and profitability, we are confident in Netflix's long-term outlook. Over the next decade, we estimate the company can achieve double-digit annual revenue growth, significantly expanding its operating profit margins, and grow its earnings per share by more than 20% per year. 20% EPS growth for over 10 years. Moreover, the company is now cash flow positive, which over time will enable capital return through share buybacks. He loves the share buybacks in the coming years. We believe Netflix's current valuation represents a meaningful discount to intrinsic value for a business of its quality and exceptional growth potential. So that is Bill Ackman's commentary on Netflix, and I think that fits very well with the Bill Ackman checklist. He looks for brand value, pricing power, he looks for margin expansion, a company that will eventually become very free cash flow positive and do buybacks in the coming years. He looks for good leadership. He looks for a company with a wide moat that can fend off competitors. He highlighted qualitatively all of those things in this description. So of course, Bill Ackman looks at both the numbers and he looks at the qualities of the company. And I think that Netflix does make sense in his portfolio. Now, the next one that I'll highlight is Canadian Pacific Railway. This is a brand new investment in Bill Ackman's portfolio. And at first, I really didn't know how this one fit in. I was a little bit confused by it. I thought maybe this is like a commodities play. Uh, he's investing in companies like Netflix and Domino's and then a railway. Seemed quite random. But he does highlight in one of the paragraphs here, I think the core reason why he's investing in this company. He says Canadian Pacific has been the fastest growing North American class one railroad 
with an average organic growth rate of 6% over the last five years. In December, Canadian Pacific closed the acquisition of Kansas City Southern, which we believe will be a transformational and value-creating transaction. I think this is the primary reason. The acquisition of KCS positions Canadian Pacific to be the only North American railway, railroad with a direct route from Canada to Mexico, and it will result in significant revenue and cost synergies. KCS's rail network is at the center of the North American rail system, linking Mexico to major markets in the Midwest, the Southeast regions of the United States. The CP-KCS combination will connect six of the seven largest metro regions in North America in direct route and offer unparalleled speed and service for customers. Canadian Pacific currently owns KCS through a voting trust, which entitles Canadian Pacific to full economic ownership of the company, but does not permit Canadian Pacific to take operational control of the railroad until it receives regulatory approval of which pending merger application. We expect this approval to occur by the end of the year. I think this is the big reason. He sees this acquisition as having all sorts of synergies, and he thinks that this will create a better value proposition. So I think that this event is why he decided to jump back into it. But he does highlight one other thing. And this is another thing that I tried to highlight that Bill Ackman always does. He buys companies when they trade down below their historical valuation. He says Canadian Pacific shares have recently traded at a discounted valuation relative to history and its peers. When companies become discounted relative to their long-term history and their companies that he likes, that he thinks has good qualities, that's the time that he typically jumps in on them. So when I looked at this overall, I see it as one good thing happening to this company that he thinks will have a lot of good synergies on top of a company that is well insulated from lots of competitors and threats because it's a railway, it's more like a utility company, plus it's trading at a discount and all those factors I think make it attractive for an investment for Bill Ackman. Now, the last one that I want to highlight is another new investment in a company that I'm currently invested in, which is Domino's. Bill Ackman recently purchased Domino's right around here and it traded up like crazy, right? It went up 50% and then it traded right back down. And since it traded down so much, I had this company on my radar for a while. I wanted in on it, and now it's traded down to just around like 8 10% from his buy-in. And I decided to take the jump into this company with my passive income portfolio. So that's a dividend portfolio. Domino's fits really well into that portfolio. But that's kind of the story with Domino's so far with Bill Ackman. He says that our investment in Domino's was off to a strong start with shares up over 50% from when we made our investment in March through the end of 2021. Driven by robust operating results and a late year Omicron driven rally at the stay at home stocks, most of these gains disappeared in the first few months of this year with Domino's stock price declining 29% through the end of March 22nd. In addition to the broad market sell-off, especially in higher growth companies, we believe that the recent stock price weakness is attributable to an ongoing slowdown in same-store sales growth that begin in the third quarter of 2021. Domino's has a long history of defying the skeptics and outperforming following brief periods of weakness, and we believe that this time is no different. So the big problem with Domino's was slowing same-store sales growth. That's what investors became concerned about. He says the recent deceleration is driven primarily by driver shortages due to the current state of the U.S. labor market, which is acutely impacting the delivery business that comprises two-thirds of sales. While driver shortages have led to shortened hours and customer service challenges at many locations, the company is taking corrective action by conducting a full assessment of the driver labor market, launching new hiring and training systems, and eliminating time-consuming in-store tasks. So basically, Domino's is on top of this. They know that driver shortages is a challenge. They're taking all sorts of action to fix this. He says that in light of high inflation and labor food costs, Domino's recently refreshed its core mix and match delivery offers by raising the price point from $5.99 to $6.99 and adding new products to the offer. Now, he says we estimate that this $1 increase will be a several percentage point tailwind to same store sales growth. So just increasing these items from $5.99 to $6.99 when you're selling this much stuff will increase the same store sales growth by several percentage points without taking into account any positive benefit to ticket that Domino's has historically seen from new product additions. 
This is the first time the company has ever increased the prices on this offering in over 12 years. And we continue to believe that Domino's customer value proposition remains exceptional. Product innovation and peak level of advertising funds and the return of key promotions should provide additional tailwinds to sales growth. So Bill Ackman believes that Domino's traded down in price because same store sales slow down, but he thinks that it will be very short lived. He thinks that Domino's is going to reaccelerate same store sales right back to where they've been for the past 12 years. And this will be a short lived blip. Again, this is another point where I agree with him. I think it's a great company that's attractively valued. He says Domino's currently trades at a mid 20s multiple of Ford earnings, a compelling valuation given its leading position in the quick service restaurant pizza category, enabled by its own crown jewel, the delivery infrastructure. That is something that really no other company I know of. No other quick service restaurant has quite like Domino's. The high certainty nature of the business and its mid to high teens long-term earnings growth. We are pleased that the company is taking advantage of its depressed share price by continuing to repurchase shares consistent with its long-standing policy of returning excess cash to shareholders. And of course, that's something that Domino's does. They do massive amount of share buybacks. So as the price falls, you know Domino's themselves is a big buyer of the company. So that's all I'm going to highlight from this letter, but I think that paints a more well-rounded picture. So you have Part one of how Bill Ackman picks stocks, the fundamentals, the share buybacks, the dividends, it trading below historical valuation. But this gives you a view of more of the qualitative aspects. He really does deep dive research into every single company so that he understands the business inside and out. And I think that's what you have to do if you're investing large amounts into individual companies. You need to know what you own. So I'm going to be following Bill Ackman. I'll continue to look at his portfolio as well as many other great investors. And you can learn about more of that here. So I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one.